Hopefully that's synchronized when we get done with this. Uh, this is Turn Bark Time. I am the turn. I am the bark. And we're still going to be here a long time. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, as you can see behind Barker, you can see that this is going to be a four content video. So this is what we are teaching our students right now. We're hoping they will watch. I'm uh, pretty excited about it. So... Uh, I talked about it yesterday I, or uh, last week. I felt bad. I kind of got really hyped up uh, getting ready to talk about Hamilton, and we are not there just yet. We're going to introduce uh, the start of our country. So, Barger, you want to take that away? So, yeah, for students following along at home, we're in Chapter 11, which is political developments in the early republic. And so we're going to start with the first president, George Washington. Um, who takes his oath of office during April in 1789. And it kind of starts off in the chapter talking about the debate of how much power does the national government get or the executive get. So it's kind of like the seesaw that I've talked about in the past where, you know, is it states versus the you know federal government who has more power? What should that balance be? When Washington shows up, they also talk about what should they call him Two guys made a great video about that. Maybe you should look on our video list, episode one, uh, about what we should call the president. And then we really get into setting up the executive branch. What's, uh, what's interesting about this is we're actually seeing this play out, right? Like this, the teeter-totter you're talking about with the uh, states versus federal government, this is actually playing out. We just had a discussion about this. Um, the president is currently uh, saying that he has the power to open – the economy to the people while the governors of, of states are saying, no, 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 that's our job. You know, you're, we have the authority to open up our own states. So we're seeing this play out even right now. Um, so Washington gets his inauguration and he has this really, I'm going to, I'm going to say like profound kind of realization or epiphany that everything that he does will become the standard and the base for presidents from here on out. And, and we call that a precedent. And it's always fun to teach the precedents of the presidents because then you know you get a little word tongue tie. But Washington is gonna lay this out. So Congress has two jobs right now. They're basically trying to draft a bill of rights to get the president elected. Well, as we know from uh, previous discussions, I think another great episode made was something about the Electoral College. You might wanna check that out. I wanna say it's episode six. Um, and basically at the time, the way the electoral college worked was every elector from a state got two votes and the first vote, uh, it didn't matter. You didn't rank the people. You just voted twice. You get to vote for two people you thought were qualified. So the first place, uh, person would get the presidency. The second place would get, uh, the runner up would get the vice presidency. Uh, imagine a world where Hillary Clinton is currently Donald Trump's vice president. Obviously, we make a change later on. Uh, and every single electoral vote that he could have gotten, Washington got. He Landslide victory wasn't even close. Uh, and the runner-up is John Adams, who, who receives the most other votes. Uh, and so they intend to become our very first president and vice president of the United States. I think one of the reasons that that kind of happens that way too, is that Jefferson was in France. So he wasn't around being part of those debates and that discussion leading up to the immediate election. Um, that's really similar. That's really close to that rank choice voting where you essentially rank, who do you, like, who's your first choice? Who's your second choice? Where like in some, some governments, they do that all the way down through like, if there's 10 people, you rank them one, one through 10. So it's kind of a, a play on that a little bit. So it's kind of a neat deal. So one of the things that they do is they realize that Washington, the executive branch, the president can't do everything by himself. And one of the things that Washington is often given credit for is 
surrounding himself with smart people and not and realizing that he didn't know everything um and so he they decide what the congress decides on three departments yeah congress hashes out so basically there's all these arguments about how big the government should be and again you got to remember we're coming off the revolution we're coming off the declaration of independence where big governments are scary right because big governments can um abuse their power and be uh tyrannical towards the people in which they're supposed to govern so they come up with these three departments the department of treasury which oversees the nation's finances um this department of state which is all about foreign diplomacy setting up relations with foreign nations by sending delegations to have deliberations so and then the last one is the War Department, which now we call the Department of Defense because it's less aggressive. Um, makes it sound like we're defending ourselves rather than punching people in the face when we go to war. Um, and so Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, who was Washington's aide de camp during the war, becomes his financial or the Secretary of the Treasury. Thomas Jefferson becomes Secretary of State. And the Secretary of War is Henry Knox, who Fort Knox is named after. And what's interesting about Henry Knox is if as students, especially you guys, if you remember us watching the John Adams video where um, Adams is arguing in Philadelphia uh, over the Declaration of Independence and Mrs. Adams comes out in the rain and there she's holding like the musket and it's, it's pouring down rain and they're dragging those cannons through the mud. The guy on the back of the horse, that's Henry Knox, who will become one of the generals. He's an artillery specialist and he actually sold books. He, he owned a bookstore in Boston before he becoming a general in the Revolutionary War and later the, the Secretary of War uh, for our, our first cabinet. And what's interesting is, again, Washington surrounded him, his, himself with people who were um, different minded. And that, that's what's really unique about this. And it, compared to what we think of today, right, presidents like we talked about in Andrew Jackson, since then, presidents have kind of put people who think like them in their cabinet, where Washington surrounded himself with people. He's like, I don't care. I want the best person for the job here. Um, and, and so that's what happens. Um, and again, like going back, like we can talk about and we'll talk about it more is if you've ever seen the or listened to the soundtrack of Hamilton, you kind of start to pick up on where Lin-Manuel Miranda gets his motivation from these these key pieces. So Washington uh, forms his cabinet, and there's one other guy that's in this photo. I'm going to make an assumption, and uh, sometimes that doesn't work out well. But Washington did have a fifth member of his cabinet, uh, if you counted himself, and that was Edmund Randolph, who was the first attorney general of the United States. And as attorney general, he's in charge of all legal matters uh, for the country itself. Put it in perspective, Washington had, we'll say, four people in his cabinet. The president, modern presidents have 15. And I mean, obviously, that's part of that is that the country's gotten a lot bigger. Things have gotten more complex with technology and communication happening a lot faster than it did back then. One of the big differences you'll see, um, not only in their political beliefs about like the size of government, is whether people in the government are Anglophiles or Francophiles which is a really fancy word for saying, do they like England, right, Anglo, or do they like France more? Because like Adams and or Washington and Hamilton will definitely be bigger proponents in favoring a relationship with Great Britain, where Thomas Jefferson is a much bigger proponent of being friends with France. And not to like overstretch ourselves, because obviously our next lecture is going to be on the following sections. Uh, but one of the things that when we look at and we talk about this is is two complete Jefferson and Hamilton have two complete different views of society and and how government should function. And so we run into our our Washington runs into his very first test uh, as president uh, after kind of establishing it. So if you have been following along, we have now kind of moved to section two. We, we covered section one which was Washington's uh, launching the government. Now we're on section two, which is Washington as a president. So the first real test is the Whiskey Rebellion. We as a country are hashing out how to tax things so that we can pay back the debt from the Revolutionary War. We owe a ton of money. And one of the things we actually owe money on is we owe reparations 
for loyalists who lost their land that was seized by patriots and things like that. We owe France and Spain money that they loaned us during the war. We own our own citizens money for fighting in the war and loaning us money. And as we uh, have looked at the Articles of Confederation, you guys would remember from previous uh, talks that we had in class that the Articles of Confederation doesn't allow taxing. Well, now we can tax. And one of the first people and biggest proponents of taxation is Alexander Hamilton as uh, Secretary of the Treasury. So we're debating what do we tax? How much do we tax? And the decision was made that we are going to tax whiskey. Okay. And again, you take you tax my whiskey, I'm going to be upset, right? Uh, one of the big uh, groups that this angered was people in the West. And the West is a new area of the United States. And again, when I say West, I'm not saying Washington, Oregon, California, Idaho. I'm talking about Ohio, what will become Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, that kind of region of the country. And what happened was they would grow wheat out there. Wheat, sorry, wheat, wheat, wheat. I'm not saying the other word that students always laugh at because they think I say weed. Okay, they're growing wheat. Um, and it was very expensive to ship your wheat across the Appalachian Mountains to market. And so what they would do is they would turn it into whiskey because it was more efficient and, and cost effective to turn that product, and it could be corn too or anything grown kind of deal, distilled into alcohol to send across because it's cheaper um, and it was actually easier to get your product to market and make money. And so Alexander Hamilton says, this is brilliant. We're going to tax whiskey and we're going to tax it on the sale and the, the production. Well, Westerners are very upset by this um, because they think it's an attack directly at them. Yeah, and so what they begin doing, as you can see behind me, is they begin essentially doing what we did during the American, or the lead up to the American Revolution when we were fighting against British taxation, is you go out and you find the tax collector and you less than politely convince them to not collect taxes. So you threaten to beat them up, you beat them up, or then, as you can see in the image behind me, you cover them in tar and then douse them in feathers and then make them straddle a uh, beam as you parade them through town, which is one, painful and rather humiliating. And so this, some of the lead up happens, they do end up dropping the tax a little bit, um, two years into it, but it doesn't solve the problem. And it begins to come to a point where, again, the, the job of the executive branch is to execute the laws. Right, it doesn't mean to kill people. It means to make sure that the laws are followed, enforcement. And so there's debate between Washington and Hamilton, who are both ex-military men. Right, Hamilton, you could argue, is still kind of involved in the military, and people still refer to Washington often as General Washington. Um, they say we need to use the national government needs to use force to prevent this from getting out of hand. And so they end up, Washington takes control of 13,000 militiamen, and then they, they head over the Appalachians to kind of like convince these farmers to go home or else. And this is this is taking place in western Pennsylvania because, again, like Barker said, they, they dropped the tax a little bit, and most farmers were at this point are like, okay, I'm just going to pay up. Like, it, fine, they dropped it a little bit. But Western Pennsylvania, this is an actual issue. And Washington becomes the first president and only president to actually lead troops into battle during the presidency. Yeah, and Jefferson is against this. Um, he, We talk about those philo the philosophies. He doesn't feel that this is, you're not talking your way through the problem. You're essentially bullying your way through the problem, which brings back, it's, it's reminiscent of the use of force by the British you know, at Lexington and Concord to come seize arms from the colonists. And so, you know, he voices his opposition, but ultimately the decision comes down to the president to make, you know, to decide what policy will be. And, and, and so, again, the, this ends up being the first time, and it's kind of the first time that we see that we're not going to be ruled by a mob, right? Every time something happens that we don't like, we don't get to have a revolution. Right. One of the big things that Jefferson wrote himself in the Declaration of Independence was that uh, governments long withstanding shall not be changed for light or transient causes. And so, again, the, the focus here is not to change the government. You don't get to openly rebel. Right. Like you have to 
the government needs to put its foot down, and that's what happened in this scenario. The second thing that happens during Washington's presidency is the beginning of the French Revolution. And uh, Washington actually is kind of looks to his cabinet to figure out what to do here because we have France overthrowing a monarchy, right? Very similar to what, what the United States did. So you're like, oh man, like, you know, you're taking up our action. We're, we're doing it like we should. Um, however, the French Revolution starts to lose a little bit of control. And uh, the long story short, the new revolutionary government, after beheading the king and, and, and queen of England or of, of France, sorry, uh, actually starts listening to the crowd to basically behead anybody who is a noble or well-to-do. Um, this includes men, women, and children. Uh, About and so 20,000 of them. Yes. This is a little, obviously, very scary, right, when you talk about there, because there are a lot of people, especially in Hamilton's role, who kind of have this aristocracy feel about them, that the, if this happens, this could happen in the United States and, and lead to the crush of the government and people just being under mob rule. Yeah, this is this is one of my favorite ironies in history is that the king of France, the, the French Revolution happens because the king of France spent too much money funding the American Revolution to beat Britain, right? It wasn't because he loved America, it's because he hated Britain. And because he spent that money, he it hurt the economy in France, and then they had a revolution to overthrow him because he supported the revolution that inspired them to be revolutionary. So it kind of like hoisted by his own petard. Yeah. Um, and then like the American revolution stands out in history as one of the only revolutions where the pre-war like bourgeoisie or rich people are the rich people at the end of the revolution. One of the, one of the trends that we tend to see in revolutions is that the revolutionary regime will come in and eliminate that upper class aristocracy to free up economic resources and money and then it gets redistributed around to other people like the same thing happens spoiler alert world war one um you know when russia the bolsheviks rise up and they kill czar nicholas and his people they go through and they eliminate the rich and then redistribute that money or give it to the government to be used in a more efficient way um you know so <laughs> that's that's one of the things that people are fearing in the united states is if all the poor people realize that there's more poor people than there are rich people and everybody has guns in America, they have more guns than we do. You know what I mean? So that's, that's one of the fears that they're trying to balance out as this is moving forward. But again, the French run under this. The, the, the revolution starts with the three ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity, which brotherhood, not the college frat house mentality. Oh, no animal house? Dang. No, no animal house. Oh, God. Toga. Nope. All right. You guys are too young for that movie. Um, last thing. So with the French Revolution, we basically kind of declare a, a statement of neutrality. And and again, the I'm trying to remember Hamilton lyrics. And there's the famous rap battle number two, or cabinet battle, cabinet rap battle number two, is about what we should do in France. And uh, and when you know, George Washington basically says to Jefferson, he says, he's, we'll help when the French figure out who's going to lead him. And Jefferson says, the people are leading. And Washington replies, the people are rioting, right? Like that's, I mean, that's really what's happening. And and there are people in, in Jefferson's mind, France was this, they were doing the right thing. They were standing up for themselves. But he kind of let, in Washington's eyes, at least in the, in the musical, uh, that he's letting his his ambition about liberty and the people's government, you know, take away what's actually happening during this. He's he's not being pragmatic enough, not being realistic enough. He's being too too idealistic. Yeah. The Hamilton's rebuttal to that is, ask King Louis's head, right? And then King Louis's head says, "I'm dead." You know, do whatever you want because I'm dead. Super so dead. yeah, there is no leader in France. Yeah. And, and so, so oh, go ahead. Nope. we're kind of caught. I always explain this to my kids as like a love triangle, the United States is at the top. Then there's these two girls, there's England and Britain, you know, like, or Britain and France. Like, who do we want to be? 
who do we want to be friends with? And it's like, well, if you talk too much to France, Britain gets mad. And if you talk too much to, you know, the other one, the other one gets mad. And so like, we're trying to be the player and, and find the right balance of why can't I be friends with both? You know, is kind of what Washington is saying. And and he'll he'll actually warn against this. So that's that's the last piece of of section two is Washington's farewell address. Which again, if you have the opportunity to listen to Hamilton, I recommend the edited lyrics because obviously as a teacher, there's a lot of swearing and things like that in there. But there's a um, song called "One Last Time," which is basically Washington's farewell address. Washington steps forward and says, "I'm not going to run for president at this time." Jefferson has stepped down as Secretary of State because he is so upset with the way the government's being run that he feels he needs to run for president. And so Washington comes forward and says, I'm not going to run for president either. I'm done. And one of my favorite stories about Washington, Washington is one of his, his heroes is Cincinnatus. And again, for those of you who haven't been in my class or Barker's class, Cincinnatus sounds familiar. There's a city in Ohio, Cincinnati named after him, but he's basically this Roman general. And then again, long story short, he is a general that Rome comes to when Rome's about to be destroyed. And they say, Cincinnati, we need you. And he's a farmer. And he's like, I just want to farm. Like, that's all I want to do. Like, leave me alone. And they're like, no, like, Rome needs you. And he goes, fine. He's like, I'll come. I'll help. But at the end, I'm not your emperor. I get to come home and farm. So Cincinnati leads the Roman legions. They defeat the, the invaders. And they're like, Cincinnati, you're our new emperor. And he's like, no, I'm going home. I'm farming. That's it. I'm done. I did my service. I'm, I'm out. And Washington takes that mindset. Right. He wants to hand over power and be done with it. Right. He's one of the most reluctant leaders in history, uh, as far as we can tell. He does not want the job. Right. But he knows he has to take it to unite the country. Um, and so in his farewell address that he gives, he warns of two main things. So I'll talk about one. Barker, I'll talk about the other. Uh, the first thing he warns against okay, is getting involved in European affairs. Right. He sees the United States as a young, vulnerable country and Europe goes to war every time somebody sneezes. Right. They are always fighting each other. They don't like each other. They, they change land more times than count. People speak French and English just because they're like, I, I don't know. Is it Monday? All right. France, it is. Let's speak French. All right. Oh, hey, England just rolled through. Cool. We'll, we'll go back to English now. And, that, and that's the difficulty. And so Washington warned, he said, don't get into any foreign alliances. Like, stay out of them. We don't need them. We need to, to, to worry about our own problems. Part number two, Barker's going to talk about with his map behind him. Okay. The second thing is he, he rails against political parties and factionism. He's like, it's the, it's the worst development, like, in politics is the creation of political parties. And so my head is in front of the two parties there. Like today, we always talk about Democrats and Republicans, and students are always like, well, what does it mean to be a Democrat? What does it mean to be a Republican? And we always break it down and start talking about issues and kind of what positions are, because it really isn't Democrats and Republicans, if you go back 100 years, they actually like were arguing for the opposite of what they argue for today. So it's, it's a misnomer when people try and go back too far with the political parties. But the first two political parties that come up are the Federalists, so like federal government, which would be Hamilton and Washington, they favor a strong federal government. And then there's the Democratic Republicans, which always confuses students because that's both parties today. Yep. How could they be both parties at the same time? Um, and that was led by Jefferson and a lot more of the people who wanted the Southerners or the, you know, the states that wanted less federal control and more kind of almost like a, they wanted to throw back to the Articles of Confederation where the states had more power. And so behind me is the map of 1796, the election of 1796, uh, where John Adams will go on and defeat Jefferson, kind of riding on the coattails of Washington. And you can also see that under Washington's presidency, we add Kentucky, Tennessee, and Vermont. So we have 16 states by the end of it. So we've already grown, you know, we've already added three states. Vermont comes out of New York. It was already kind of happening during the revolution, but it... it Viva Vermont, you guys are special. Um, and then eventually Maine will break away. It's part of Massachusetts still, which is confusing again. But, you know, Washington is really big and he says, we shouldn't forget that we came through the American Revolution, the struggle together to make this country. And we should, you know, really kind of unify ourselves on the idea of this is the nation that, you know, 
we get to build. That's a Hamilton lyric right there. Um, you know, like we shouldn't throw that away just because we disagree on some stuff. Like we, we're going to lose sight of the bigger picture and then somebody else, like a foreign nation, could come in. Because at this point, we're still trying to get Britain to respect our borders and we've still got to worry about Spain because – Half of North America is pretty much owned by Spain at the time, too. You know, we're, we're an infant country still like, you know, don't beat us up. We're really big, too. And we'll see what happens. War of 1812. Cool. Andrew Jackson video. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, like that's one of the reasons why after World War II, we passed an amendment saying that you're limited to two terms as president because people looked up to Washington so much for having all the power and being willing to step down. Right, which is a huge thing. It's one of the people talk about like communism. One of the ways that the communist utopia is supposed to work is that there's a dictator during the transition from traditional government to the utopia, and then when you get to the end, the person's supposed to step down. And people say, well, that's that's where it falls apart because nobody who's a dictator would ever step down and give up power. You know, not saying that Washington was a dictator, but he had a lot of power, um, and because he chose to limit himself it led to that being a more limited position as we moved forward. And, and that, that brings up the, the kind of last part. One of the unique things about the United States uh, that people have noticed, especially if they come as a refugee or they come as an immigrant from, a, from a, a more unstable government situation, is the peaceful transition of power, right? You, you can go back and watch the inauguration of Donald J. Trump and you watch Obama treat him, you know, with respect. And, and yeah, maybe it was just in front of the camera or whatever. But, but Obama didn't say, no, I don't like this guy. I'm going to hold my spot. He said, the American people have voted. The Electoral College has spoken. I'm peacefully giving you power. And that's a unique thing in the world. I won't say it's unique to just our country, but it's unique. It's a unique thing in the world. So that is section, the introduction, sections one and two of chapter 11. Uh, or lesson 11 in your TCI book. That would be like if Barker and I were lecturing about it and talking about it in our classrooms. Um, again, hopefully uh, you're seeing this video, you're enjoying yourselves, and you're staying safe uh, during this uncertain times. Anything else, Bark? No, I think we've got it. And then we'll cover the next video that we have next week. We'll cover those two political parties in more detail, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, and we'll kind of talk about what were their beliefs and what made them apart in more detail than we already have. And if you're lucky, we maybe will wrap some Hamilton for you guys. So clean version, of course. So Sweet. until next time, I'm Turn. I'm Bart. And we're going to be here a long time. Have a good night. Be safe. And, and be well. It's good to be back, guys.